First St. Andrews. We are, while we are still under lockdown due to COVID, we are hoping that the church might be open next week, April the 11th. On this Easter Sunday, we are inviting you to celebrate communion in your homes. And for that, you will need a piece of bread and a small glass of grape juice or of wine. We wish you all a blessed and a happy Easter. We acknowledge that First St. Andrew's United Church is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapiwak, and Attawandaran peoples, on lands connected with the London Township and Sambra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant wampum. We value a close relationship with the members of the local Chippewa, Oneida and Muncie Delaware nations, as well as the urban indigenous population. This land continues to be home to diverse indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land. We value the important historical and contemporary contributions to our society of the original peoples of Turtle Island. <laughs>
we light this Christ candle with great joy that Christ is risen. We light this Christ candle with great thanksgiving that the darkness has not overcome the light. We light this Christ candle in joy because Jesus Christ lives among us and within us. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We come this day in great joy, O God, to celebrate the wonderful miracle that you bring life out of death. The resurrection of Jesus reminds us that nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from your love. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>
gospel lesson for today comes from the Gospel of John, reading in chapter 20, the first 20 verses. Now, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed. So she ran. She ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord away out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following after him. Simon went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed, for as yet they did not know or understand the Scriptures, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, and turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Whoopin, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Where, where have you carried him away? Tell me where you have laid him, and I will go to him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what, what he said to her. When it was evening, on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples were met were locked for fear of the authorities. Jesus could, stood, came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
after he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. For the Word of God in Scripture, among us and within us, thanks be to God. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. This Good Friday Easter story is the centerpiece of our Christian faith, the touchstone of our faith. And so we rel re rel celebrate it with all the pomp and circumstance that we can think of. This Good Friday Easter story should never be separated because they are different sides of the same coin. Truth is, being human, we do separate them. Folded grave clothes are a sign of the resurrection, of death left behind and moving on to a new life. And it is ours. It is ours. Profoundly and experientially, as well as theologically and spiritually, When Anne and Ted's firstborn became seriously ill, I rushed to the hospital and performed a hasty baptism. When Darren died, Anne and Ted had the baby cremated but there was no funeral. The urn was placed on the mantel in the family room beside a picture of Darren. Then and Ted both plunged into grief. The nursery, the room that they had prepared for their son, became a shrine. And when sleep evaded her, Anne would go and sit in the rocking chair in the nursery and grieve. Such grieving tested her faith and her marriage to the breaking point. Two years later, on the anniversary of Darren's death, I visited Anne at home. She welcomed me, ushered me into the family room. My eyes went naturally to the, to the mantle, but there was no urn. And bewildered, I turned to Anne. I'm pregnant, she said. I'm pregnant. We'll never forget, Darren, but there is a new baby to be birthed. Then Anne, she took me to the nursery. And she and Ted had totally redone the nursery in preparation for the new arrival. Did you notice the folded grave clothes? When his wife left him, 
Howard was absolutely devastated. He lived in a kind of fog, doing the absolute minimum needed to keep himself going. He dropped out of the squash club and out of church. His ch children would telephone me from time to time, concerned about their dad's health and his state of mind. I would visit him occasionally. The house took on an uncared-for look about it, and our conversations, which started off well, would soon spiral downwards. How c could she? I, I never saw it coming. I never thought that I would end my life with this way. One spring day, I met Howard in the grocery store, pressed slacks, recent haircut, a positive demeanor, and a definite tan. You're looking good, I said. Yes, he replied. I'm just back from three weeks in the Dominican Republic. I shook, took some time off work and volunteered for Habitat for Humanity. It totally changed my life. I have some sick days coming, and I've signed up for another project in the fall. folded grave clothes. When Sherry DeNova resigned from her job as a successful executive to study for the ministry, she had no idea what a change it would make in her life. When she was called to Emmanuel Howard Park United Church in Toronto's West End, it was to a congregation that was shrinking and declining fast. In her book, Querying Evangelism, Growing a Community from the Outside In, she tells of how a dying congregation opened its doors to the LGBT two-spirited who lived in the community around her congregation. The congregation became radically inclusive, as Jesus was radically inclusive. And despite the hate mail and the bomb threats and the occasional picketing, Emmanuel Howard Park is a growing congregation. It has even started holding evening services. A recently installed stained glass window is in memory of a beloved member a bipolar, chan transgestured musician named Dell. In the window, Dell is seated at the piano with lilies all around him. Congregation is a healthy mix of gays and straights, young families with children, working folk, singles, transgendered, and street people. Whenever they were asked what brought them to Howard Park, Emmanuel Howard Park, 
Most people same would say, we came for the community, but we stayed for Christ. Folded grave clothes. Something happened to those early disciples that we can only guess at. They thought that life was over, ended, buried. They had witnessed the crucifixion. Some had even bought, even, some had even carried the body to the tomb. And now this, now this, stones rolled aside, folded grave clothes. Attend any AA meeting. Attend any of Shelley's babes of this congregation. A group of women, many of whom are cancer survivors, or many other groups like them, and you will hear story after story after story of folded grave clothes. Listen to the story of your life, the hills you have climbed, the moments of betrayal, the moments of denial, the times of trial, Mark, the nail prints in your own hand. Feel the stab of the spear in your own side. Look around you at others, and they too have worn folded grave clothes. John Newton sings about such a time in his own life in his hymn, Amazing Grace. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. St. Patrick, looking around at his little group of followers and thinking of every one of them as a Christ to him, sings, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ within me, Christ to comfort and restore me. We too can sing with John Newton or St. Patrick. Think of those when we think of those friends and strangers, teachers and mentors who have helped us over rough patches in our own lives. And as I continue to mend from my stroke, it is a hymn that I am now currently singing with new insights. You and I know this Good Friday, Easter Sunday story. Not simply because we have heard it a hundred times in church, because it is our story. We have lived it. We have tasted it. 
Ask any survivor of abuse, addiction, divorce, rape, exile, public shunning. Ask you anyone who has been targeted because of their color, because of their sexuality, because of their culture, because of their beliefs. We know this story intimately, profoundly. It is our story. Though we often run to Easter, not wanting to dwell too long on the pain, the residual pain of Good Friday. But it is all one story. And we know what it is like to fold grave clothes and roll aside stones that prevent us from moving forward. We also know of the decision to step into a new day, into a new relationship, into a new chapter of our lives. There may be other crucifixions, but death is not the end of the story. The end of the story is resurrection and folded grave clothes. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.
grateful to all those who support this community of faith by their offerings of money, by the gifts offered in kind. We appreciate everything that you do to encourage us in our great ministry to this great city and the world around. In Christ's name, your offerings are received. things of life, food, drink, and money. And in bringing them, we bring ourselves. Take this food and drink from our table to your table and feed us with your love. Take us and our gifts of money to do your work in the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we come to celebrate communion at this table, let us pray. Since you will be celebrating communion in your own homes. I thought that I would use the tradition of our Jewish brothers and sisters. Whenever they celebrate Passover, which has become the foundation of our communion service, generally a young child asks certain questions. The first is, why do we thank, give thanks at this table? Why do we give thanks at this table? Because we did not create ourselves or the world. It is God's gift to us. It is God's gift to share with all peoples and all animals and creatures, all plants and the air and the water of this world. So it is we give thanks. Why do we eat bread at this table? We gather to remember that on this night, the night before he died, Jesus ate with his friends. He broke the bread and said to them, This is my body given for you. Each time you eat, remember me. Why do we drink cup? Why do we drink from the cup at this table? Well, that same night Jesus took a cup, passed it to his friends, and said, Drink from this cup. It is a gift. It is a gift of God poured out for you. Whenever you drink, Remember me. What do we remember at this table? We remember his death. We celebrate his resurrection. 
and so proclaim the mystery of our own faith. For whom do we pray at this table? We pray for God's world. It is a world at war with itself. And so we pray for God's spirit of peace. It is a world in which we are at war with one another. And so we pray for God's spirit of reconciliation. It is a world that we have mistreated. And so we pray for God's spirit of forgiveness. And all of this we pray in the words that Jesus taught us to live by, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So it is on this day, remembering what Jesus did in that evening, we fold our grave clothes, lay them aside, break bread with one another, do this in remembrance of me. Having first given thanks, he poured some wine into the cup. And said to them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink ye all of it in remembrance of me. Come then and eat and drink, drink with thankgivings in your heart. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Jesus Christ, cup of life. Eat and drink in thanksgiving for Jesus. Amen.
Let the church with gladness sing songs of triumph, for Christ is risen and lives among us. Go in peace, live in love, and may the Holy Spirit work with you, both within you and through you. Amen.